Uh, welcome to the Teaching Learning Technology Roundtable kickoff for this academic year. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Paul Fisher. I'm the Associate Chief Information Officer and the Director of the Teaching, Learning and Technology Center. It's my 25th TLTR kickoff, and I'm excited mm -hmm. for the privilege to co-chair the group this year. As you can see, the event is being held in Microsoft Teams as a regular meeting as opposed to a live uh, event or webinar, and that's so that participants can engage with our speakers today. However, because of the sheer number of people in the meeting today, for the duration of the introductions and during the presentation, all attendee microphones and cameras will be disabled. There will be a Q&A period after today's presentation. During the Q&A period, attendees are asked to raise your hand. When we call on you by the moderator, which will more than likely be me, your microphone and camera will be enabled and you can, you can uh, also ask questions in the chat. We will be recording today's session and the recording will be available on YouTube shortly after the event. I'd like to take just a minute to remind or introduce those new to the university why we're here today. Established in 1995, the Teaching, Learning and Technology Roundtable is composed of representatives from academic and administrative areas of the university, sponsored jointly by the Office of the Provost and the Department of Information Technology. The Teaching, Learning and Technology Roundtable is a consortium of faculty, administrators and students who on behalf of the university meet and discuss issues and topics related to instructional technology. The roundtable is comprised of action teams, which meet regularly to discuss institutional issues related to using technology in teaching and learning. During the course of the year, those action teams make recommendations on many different technological fronts. The TLTR has always been a place where the university has tackled technological challenges, recommended standards, and guided the <coughs> university in its technological innovation. In its rich history, the TLTR has given birth to the idea of mobile computing, determined a standard productivity suite and other standardized software for the university, recommended the initial pilot programs for wireless connectivity, introduced and recommended the use of pen computing in certain disciplines, developed technological accessibility standards for our courses, which led to the purchase of tools that automatically make our courses more accessible for our students, recommended the adoption of quality matters to assess online course delivery, and called for the creation of the university's maker space, Space 154, and so much more. I look forward to seeing what we will accomplish this year and in the years to come. I now have the distinct pleasure to introduce the faculty co-chair of the TLTR, my colleague and co-conspirator for many years on many things, technological, Dr. Michael Taylor. Mike is an associate provost in the Department of Political Science and Public Affairs and in the Environmental Studies program. He brings a wide range of both interests and experiences in using technology in teaching and learning, including the use of digital storytelling, the development of geotag environmental data to create location-based augmented reality experiences, and launched the Center for Mobile Research and Innovation with a $365,000 grant from Nokia, AT&T, and Microsoft. As the faculty co-chair of the TLTR, Mike will help to develop the structure and charge the action teams for the next two years. I'll turn it over to Mike so he can talk briefly about that vision. Mike. Thanks, Paul. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. The uh, I think I got a promotion in your uh, in your introduction. I'm, I'm an associate professor, not not uh, provost, but that's I'll oh. take the promotion. Um, the uh, you know Seton Hall has had such a we all know our reputation with with ed tech. It, it's um, it's it's national. It, we, we are leaders um, in terms of innovative use of technology. Uh, Paul talked about kind of the pioneering stuff back in in the mid and late 90s. Um, the establishment of a one-to-one -one mobile computing program was unheard of for a school our size. We were, I think, the second or third school in the country to take to tackle that. Um, and I, I think, you know, all of that got us a lot of attention. We, we were ranked back when campuses used to be wired. Um, we were always ranked as one of the most wired campuses in the country. Um, as an incoming uh, assistant professor in 2004, uh, I landed in this place that all of a sudden I saw all of this opportunity to really think about how I was going to teach. And there was all of these tools and there was a spirit of being innovative and, and trying things out. And, and even if it doesn't work out, it's good that you tried. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we hold on to that. Right. It's been a long time. That technology is now ubiquitous. Um, we're just we 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 use it every day. It's standardized. Um, we are no longer, you know, on that cutting edge. A lot of the universities have all caught up to us and everybody has the things that we have. Um, 
And I think it's important to kind of think back to um, the spirit that was there. And, and I want, as one of the things that Paul and I talk a lot about, is bringing that back amongst the faculty to really try to engage in um, thinking about how we can plan for the future. Um, we're coming out of a really disruptive period, right? We're coming out of the pandemic, hopefully. We're coming out of the pandemic period. Um, and during that time, our long history with technology and our institutional history with technology really is what allowed us to make this pivot in the way that we did. Um, we had computers that were standardized across all of the undergraduate students, at least. We had the same thing for faculty. Um, we had an infrastructure here that could um, remotely get services out to students and faculty who needed those things. Um, and I think, you know, that while it was disruptive and challenging and in no means was it perfect, it was a, we were able to do what we were able to do because of the longstanding history we have and the planning that had been done 20, 15, 10 years ago to get us where we are today. As we're coming out of it, I think it's really critical that we do a little bit of thinking about what we wish went through. One of the things we learned, I think, in this process is that the old standard that you can't move quickly in higher ed is not true. Um, it, we moved at a, an incredibly fast rate uh, to do this pivot. Um, and, and I think you know that was in many ways um, encouraging, but at the same time, I think we have to think about what do we take from this experience that's been positive and we don't wanna lose it. We wanna make sure that we learn from it and we grow with it. And then what are the things that it highlighted that are problems that maybe we didn't notice before um, that we really have to take a step back and say, is this what we want? And, and is this is where we're heading. Do we want to make sure we're on this path? So for this year, um, the TLTR, especially this year, we're going to be doing a lot of futuring, right? We, we want to really sit back and we want the TLTR to become a group that is thinking about five years down the road. We have a lot of units on campus that are doing great work on the day-to-day -day reaction to the problems with technology right now. Right. We have a TLTC, we have a faculty IT committee, we have um, a digital humanities committee. Uh, we have a lot of different groups out there that are actively engaged uh, in, in doing the work that's necessary for day to day operation. Um, but we do need to get a group of faculty together and, and to start thinking about what does the future look like for us and what role do we want technology to play in that? And with this year being the strategic plan coming out and being implemented, it's a great time to kind of do this around the themes of the strategic plan. And so that is what the goal for this year is, is to get a lot of faculty together and to start thinking about what do we want the university to look like? How are we going to achieve the goals that we laid out in our strategic plan? Um, and what role does technology play, both as uh, an impediment to, to getting these things done, but also as a, a, a way of uh, a lever to get us there quicker or better. Um, so, so that's kind of our, our overview. When we get into the Q&A later, we can talk a little bit more about details of what this might look like. Um, but I don't want to take too much time. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce to you our provost, Dr. Passerini, uh, who is the sponsor of the TLTR. Um, Katya brings a, a great deal of experience regarding innovation and learning in the area of academic technology, both as an administrator, um, but also as a researcher. Uh, amongst her many articles, there's quite a bit published um, on many things, including uh, technology supported experiential education, learning using interactive multimedia models, um, as well as online privacy and social media platforms. Um, so I think we're, we're really, uh, we have the kind of leadership for the TLTR that can kind of do this visioning work we want to do uh, for this year. So I'm going to stop here and turn it over to you, Katya. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, and um, for the great introduction on uh, on how everything ties with the strategic plan, but also how we need to think about our future. And I want to start with thanking everyone who's here um, and everyone who will listen to us later, um, because this is an important discussion that we need to have. So I'm delighted that um, we are here to look at how technology has impacted us in the past and and um mike had a wonderful overview on how strong we've always been but also chart charting our future so um i i wanted to give a couple of remarks and then introduce our great speaker um and i will start with something that is obvious and which is technology not only impacted our past but 
it will continue to impact our future. But the way it will do it and the way it will shape our future depends on us, on our thinking, and also on a number of factors that some of which we have control and some of which we have less control, like we accelerated to the 10th ten speed uh, for due to a pandemic. Some something though that we were able to do and deliver because we were prepared. We have prepared for the past 20 years. So I think one of the factors that I want us to remember when we think about technology is our level of preparedness. Uh, we are prepared fast. We know that we can deliver a one to many or even a many to many. Today is an example of many to many conversations. We will be able to interact, uh, but we will be able to interact only with those who wish to interact with us, right? No, they don't go on camera off and, and just listen. We have to continue to have this level of eye engagement uh, uh, that it's very important and we have demonstrated can be done. The other factor that uh, will impact the way we will use technology, I think, is our own personal tolerance of for virtual communication. Um, I don't know how many more Zoom meetings or virtual meetings like today we can do in just one single day. Uh, this is excited. It's pre pretty early in the morning, but we end the day with a similar uh, virtual interactions. It's tiring, um, especially when there are so many competing demands on our schedule so that now we have five or six or seven of these meetings one after the other. Conferences around us are also going wild, so they're offering more and more virt virtual events and the reason why they're, they're doing this and uh, any conference that I um, usually attend is now always going hybrid, uh, so always giving this opportunity which impacts our ability to network at a conference, which is usually one of the reasons why we also attend conferences. But they're doing it because it's easier, it's cheaper. You can get speakers uh, in an easier way than jumping on a plane and maybe having, being delayed because of the weather or any other reasons. So that is also here to stay and we have to adjust to that. So um, we are going to have to be a little bit more selective on what we decide to attend when we have so many competing demands. And if we transfer that to our students, Maybe even the students, when they have so many competing demands or the opportunity to do an internship or a job online, they're also going to be much more selective in which classes they're going to attend in person and which classes they're going to be attending online. So we need to be prepared for that because offering multiple options might end up being a necessity. Another thing that I wanted us to think of is um, our core value proposition as a university. I, I'm not going to call this business model because we are an, an, an educational institution, but I do want to call it value proposition. What is the value that we offer? And, and also we need to uh, remember what are our core assets? So how, do we deliver the same value online or do we deliver better value in person? And if the answer that we deliver the same value online is yes, then what happens in the campus? What is a campus and what does the campus look like in a technology embedded model? Can we realize or engage or even enjoy the same people to people relationships and network of relationships that we see in a campus? That's maybe one of our core assets and key differentiator, the relationship that we build. Amazon demonstrated that we don't need a bookstore to be able to read or s look at the pages of a book. You can do it with uh, look inside or if you don't have, even have time to look inside, you can listen to that while you're doing other things with competing demands. So we need to understand where is our value and how can we continue to have a competitive advantage by delivering our core assets. And then the last thing that I wanted to point us to is uh, the fourth factor that will impact how we use technology is our level of attention. And this is not nothing new. In the early 2000, Thomas Davenport uh, published a book in 2002, Harvard Business Press, called The Attention Economy. And it was a sequel of the knowledge economy that already revolutionized a lot of things that we used to do in organizations. 
But the tension economy has a very simple concept. When you have so many different competing demands, uh, what are you going to be paying attention to? And, uh, and for us, it, it's, it's very, very important because access to information that we provide to the students with these wonderful tools is not the same as use or it doesn't exactly transfer into learning automatically. Uh, so how do we retain the attention of the students and how do we retain the students as a well? whole? Those are all challenges that I hope you can have a, a wonderful discussion together in, in discussing. But if, um, you know, if I just think about one example um, fresh in my mind, because I just finished uh, uh, the, the Squid Games series on Netflix. If you think about Netflix model, Netflix itself, an entertainment platform, is trying to grab your attention because it doesn't give you uh, more than five seconds to move from your couch to the remote control and trying to to even shut off the TV. It's playing the next sequel of a series that you have been addicted to. So how do we get our students hooked on our lectures in the same way that uh, the Netflix model is, is doing to us when when we are at home? So these are all uh, answers that we have to find and I cannot think of a of a better presenter discussant or, or moderator for this discussion than Yan Will today to discuss this with us. So I will, I will give a, a, a little introduction um, for Yin and then also share that I had the opportunity to see some of his work I think a couple of years ago it was at the Graduate Center at CUNY uh, an incredible conference on esports and the future of esports in universities. So, so I know what level of thinking it can, it can bring us to. Ian is, a, Ian is a journalist with more than 20 years of experience covering higher education, nonprofit, and philanthropy. And currently is an assistant managing editor for Chronicle Intelligence, which is a division of the Chronicle of Higher Education. Chronicle Intelligence produces content to inform colleges and universities about national issues and develop ways to solve pressing problems on campuses. Previously at the Chronicle, he was a senior editor, helping manage a team of reporters focused on enterprise and feature stories for weekly newspaper and the daily website. He also served as an international editor and a senior writer of the Chronicle of Philanthropy, the newspaper for the nonprofit world. As a freelancer, his article have, have appeared in the Christian, Christian Science Monitor, the Religion News Service, USA Today, the Washington Post, uh, Newsday, and many other publications. And he also has experience working abroad, having lived in Germany and reported from Africa, China, Sri Lanka, and many other countries. In his role as assistant managing editor, he's had the opportunity to speak to and write about many colleges and universities ac across the country and brings a strategic view of the challenges higher education faces and the successes that move our campuses forward. Unfortunately, due to the demands of our new technology driven society, I need to step away from this meeting due to another virtual meeting that I need to attend. Uh, so I can give you my attention, quoting back Davenport, but I will leave you my heart because this is a, to a topic that I'm, uh, I really care about. But the beauty of our 24-7 technology embedded life is that I will be able to actually listen to this recording tonight from my couch, assuming that Netflix doesn't win the battle. So I thank you very much for being with us today for this great conversation. I thank Ian for joining us and I, I leave you to your virtual interactions. Thank you very much. Uh, Provost Bradford, please, Pastor Ian, thanks you very much for your, uh, that kind introduction. I appreciate that. And also thanks to Mike and Paul for inviting me today. <clears throat> thanks, Milan, also for bringing up the slides today, and we'll be going through those in a few minutes. But also thanks to everyone who is joining us live and those who have uh, maybe watching this later. So uh, as Provost Pastorini mentioned, I'm, I work for the Chronicle of Higher Education. I'm sure many of you, I hope, are familiar with it. Um, but we describe it ultimately as sort of the Wall Street Journal for colleges and universities. We cover the news and provide advice and resources to help colleges and college leaders. And of course, we try to hold institutions accountable. Um, 
I've worn a variety of hats as an editor at the newspaper, and my job for a while has been focused on something we call sort of ideas to steal. This is something sort of core to what we do in terms of the Chronicle Intelligence Unit that I help run. And what we try and focus on is making sure innovations and new ways of thinking and improvements of practices are a regular part of our stream of content. Um, and as part of that, uh, you talk about going virtual with conferences, provosts, and we certainly think about uh, the pivots that many in, in higher education have, way, have made. We've made a big pivot at the Chronicle and produced many virtual events in the last year, um, many of which I've hosted. So I've been monitoring almost weekly uh, forums and Zoom about the, how really what boils down to how does COVID, ha has it, um, how has it upended higher education and kind of what it means for the future. And so with that as sort of context for where the Chronicle is coming from, for where I'm coming from, today we're going to dig into some big issues facing colleges in the wake of the pandemic. Um, so I'm excited today, not only to sort of present some ideas, but also to hear your questions and comments. My plan is to present some data from uh, Chronicle surveys, talk about what your peers in higher ed have been telling us, and of course, offer some context. Um, but I really am excited to hear your questions and responses once I've finished to make sure I've uh, answered your questions. But I'll be honest, I don't have the answers. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm not a consultant. I'm not, techno not a technology evangelist. I'm here to raise what I think are important questions, questions that colleges need to be asking themselves. And I think Michael set it up well in the sense of that Seton Hall has had, it sounds like, a spirit of innovation. Um, and how do you kind of keep on thinking that way in a time when innovation is so needed and when things are probably moving more quickly, uh, as the provost mentioned as well, in terms of the pace of change, becoming like Netflix, all these things that seem to be bubbling up at a time when so many things are uncertain for us all. So, you know, because the answers about technology's role is ultimately asking that question the provost mentioned about your value proposition. What type of institution do you want to be? How does online learning, hybrid learning, high flex learning, some of these terms I may kind of get into here, you know, how does this fit into your vision, mission and to what your students want into how your faculty want to teach? I do think every institution is asking similar questions of themselves right now. I give you all credit. Uh, for having th this discussion with administrators, faculty, and students. I'm not sure that's happening, frankly, enough on other campuses. So it's nice to see that. Milan, why don't you go to the next slide? So with that theme of, uh, of raising good questions, uh, I want to frame my presentation here around momentum and tension. Um, this is a typical way we at the Chronicle frame our articles. Uh, where's the momentum uh, in a trend, for example? And where does that trend create tensions on a campus? You know, as you likely have heard, uh, COVID ne didn't necessarily create new trends in higher ed or more broadly. It really accelerated some and then kind of, I don't know, blew up others. Uh, this course, these, these uh, subheads here, this is not exhaustive. There are a lot of issues I'm, I'm not talking about today that are affecting higher education. Um, but as it relates to technology, here's a couple that I thought was important to raise and I'll get more into later on in our conversation. But I'm gonna get back to that point. I think all of these reflect what we were talking about earlier, Michael's point about the, the pace of change. You know, higher education has a bit of a stereotype that it is um, slow to change. Um, it's small C conservative. Um, those are good things in many ways. Those traditional approaches to teaching and learning go back you know, centuries, um, go back to Plato. There's a reason why we talk about the exchange of knowledge and the way we do as an interaction between a teacher and a student. Um, but higher ed obviously has shown also that it can change very, very quickly because of the pandemic. And so again, the question here is what's gonna happen next as we move forward, as the sector moves forward. Um, and as I note here under momentum, that's what we're talking about when we talk about remote learning, that pivot we had to make to that space when the COVID uh, took over. Um, certainly this pressure on equity and access, this has obviously been driven by COVID, but also our country's discussions about race in this country but also was predated, predated the pandemic, this question of how do we make sure we are educating all students and making sure they have access to higher education. And I do think this time has an unprecedented focus on teaching right now. As my colleague, Becky Supiano, who covers teaching for us at the Chronicle has talked about, there really has never been a moment in time that she can remember where teaching and good teaching and what is good pedagogy, not just the modality of what it's supposed to be in, but what really makes up good teaching um, has been part of the conversation in higher education at such a, a broad and high level. Um, and so it's sort of an exciting time for that too. But obviously that creates tensions as well. There's these rising expectations, both from administrators, from students, from everyone, 
in some sense about what it is that we're going to see in, from higher education as it progresses in terms of how it reaches folks with uh, different types of modalities of, of online learning or what have you. There are technology challenges that come with that, not just in terms of the right investments for technology, but in terms of training, in terms of making sure everyone's up to speed and it certainly uh, is able to um, do it well. And uh, as the provost mentioned about Zoom fatigue and Teams fatigue or whatever have you, there's general fatigue. And I can't emphasize that enough. We see that across the board, not just with um, folks from having being too tired about joining video conferences like this, but the idea that there's also challenges when it comes just to uh, the general mental health of students, um, certainly faculty burnout, especially um, among uh, female faculty who often have to uh, shoulder more of the burden of some of household responsibilities. There's some real serious concerns about that. So I'm gonna, I'll dive into some of those a little bit later and talk a little bit more about what I may mean there. But I also wanna point out this quote here and perhaps just emphasize this. This comes from Jose Antonio Bowen. Uh, he's an author, a professor. He's also the former president of Goucher College. And he spoke to us a while back about a lot of these changes. And obviously, as he says here, those that stay the same during a trans transition end up losing. And I think that is something that there is a growing concern that if institutions that don't change that don't find their way forward in this, there's going to be some winners and losers and some really concerns about some institutions falling behind. Um, so, Milan, why don't we go to the next slide? So let's talk about momentum and tension. Uh, here's one big place uh, we're going to see it a lot. You know, uh, we asked, uh, because remote re learning required by COVID, students are likely expecting a different learning environment from colleges going forward. So we surveyed 401 high school students over the summer to kind of get their gauge on what it's like to teach or what it's like to experience online learning, what's it like, what, where their preferences are, what they expect from colleges going forward. And here's what they said. Um, now, we don't have longitudinal data, which would be great to show uh, how much opinions have possibly changed. Um, but I frankly was a little surprised, as you see here, that less than half identify in person as their preference. So going forward, you know, Michael talked about five years down the road. I really wonder what is the freshman class coming in in 2022, 2023, 2024 going forward? What are they expecting? Um, do they expect a, a different type of environment than that they're going to be provided by most of higher education right now? What are they looking for? Um, I want to be clear here. This was a snapshot in time of 400 students, only 400 students across the country whose learning experiences during COVID could be vastly different and, and very, um, could have been very disruptive. So it's very hard to tell. And, but I do think institutions need to be asking themselves, what is it that uh, the students who are, are, we recruit, we attract, we enroll, what are they looking for uh, going forward? I would add here that we've heard anecdotally from students who have clamored to come back to campus um, but they weren't necessarily clamoring during COVID to come back to campus for in-person learning. There are some anecdotes we heard about students who desperately want to come back to campus and live on campus, but ended up by the end of the semester dialing into their classes remotely. Um, some of that is sort of a bit of just flexibility. Some of it may have been safety and health concerns, but I think there was sort of a, a sense that some students would be on campus in their dorm room and would prefer instead of walking across campus to their class, just that flexibility of being able to wake up and interact uh, in their classroom uh, virtually. Um, and I also think just in the future too, looking out even more broadly. So here I am in my house, I've got four kids who are in elementary school who hopefully won't bug us today. Um, but I've got these four kids and they all had a whole year of virtual learning. Um, what's that experience like for them? Um, we certainly learned in our household that some did well in it, some didn't do well in it, some need that in-person learning, certainly, especially at that age. But when they go to college, uh, knock on wood, um, you know, what is it they're expecting? What are they understanding? What is their understanding of, of what learning is in a space when they pretty much go back and forth between a laptop and a classroom in first grade? Uh, I just feel like that's a sea change in many ways, and we're really going to be grappling that, with that for the years ahead. Um, so just again, just emphasizing this, this momentum and tension here that there's, uh, I think, increased expectations in some ways of what higher education will offer. Next slide. Well, I could we catch up there? Thanks. Um, so 
so changing expectations. Um, Sixty-six percent of the respondents um, said that they are very like, unlikely or somewhat likely to take a virtual course in the future. So even though the strongest preference was for in-person, there's further evidence that high school students are interested in expecting to have a virtual component to their education here. Um, obviously, virtual component uh, can mean many different things, and maybe we can dig into that a little bit later. Um, but I think it's up to every college to define what a virtual component means for their students, getting back to the idea, and, and, and for every faculty member to do the same. I want to be clear here, the answer can be none. Um, it may not work for a certain type uh, or style of teaching or a certain type of course. But you know, we've heard during the pandemic about courses that at the beginning of it some said there's no way we can teach remotely or um, and can or have a virtual component. I'm thinking of lab courses. I'm thinking of like hands-on engineering courses. I'm thinking of performing arts courses. But many of those have been able to successfully pivot. pivot. Um, I'm sure you all have experiences, perhaps. But for example, lab courses, chemistry courses, and things like that. You know, we heard about GoPros going on top of partners' heads as they went in. As they separated. One partner would go in one day. One lab partner would go in one day, and the one would go remote, and then they would switch. And so, creative ideas like that came out during the pandemic. And I've heard from the chemistry head at department chair at Vanderbilt, who basically said to me, you know what, that works so well, because it turns out their partners were actually working better together. They had to learn how to work better together in an environment where one was remote and one was in person in the lab. So they want to figure out how to go forward with that. Um, they think that's an interesting model, perhaps, to explore. So this is one of those, what, uh, I don't love this phrase, but a COVID keeper something that perhaps worked during COVID that they can find ways for it to move forward. And similarly, we heard in the performing arts, um, specifically I heard from some folks who teach uh, uh, voice lessons saying that actually doing it remotely, allowing the student to be off camera, obviously with the audio on, but off camera with the audio on, allowed that student to express themselves and sing in a way that they would feel less self-conscious about. So it's just an interesting idea here that there are opportunities here for all types of, of lessons in some ways that um, traditionally have not thought of having a virtual component. To be sure, many of those courses are gonna work better in person. So I don't wanna say that virtual works for everything, um, but I just found it surprising when you heard about those hands-on courses that really were able to pivot, make do, and will still carry away some um, sort of um, component uh, from that or see some opportunity there. Next slide, please. So here's something I kind of wish I knew a little bit more about because I'm not quite sure what's going on here. It seems that students of tomorrow, again, these are high school students, are, are not super confident about how well uh, colleges and instructors can create virtual components. Um, what are they basing this perception on? I, I'm not sure. Uh, my guess is maybe they're really much basing it on their high school experience. Um, you know, they may not have had the best experience in pivoting to remote there. They may have read stories in, I don't know, the Chronicle and national media about colleges sometimes having a tough time with it. Uh, and maybe there's just a perception that uh, higher education hasn't embraced this fully. Um, but I think that's interesting. And I, I'd love to hear more about this. And I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, though, as well. I want to be really, really careful about overgeneralizing this survey. This is one survey among many. There's been a lot of other surveys that have shown, for the most part, similar interest in online learning and hybrid learning by students. Um, but this survey itself, you know, it's a number, limited number of students. It's a snapshot in time. Um, and we really don't know what these individual experiences were like when it came to the experience during COVID. But it's a piece of the puzzle um, to show what students may be expecting um, in the years ahead from their institutions. Let's go to the next slide. So what are your peers thinking about? Um, here is a survey we did, uh, again, uh, May, June, over the summer. Uh, responses from 855 college administrators and faculty members. Um, so we went out to ask them about technology uh, and the changes and the things that they are hearing and thinking about on their campuses. Um, I want to say that the institutions represented was public and private institutions. It was four year and two year. Um, and the administrators here uh, include college presidents, provosts, deans, CIOs, um, other folks that might be in the cabinet. Um, as well as department chairs. So we did try and reach a really broad range of, of people to kind of get their responses. And one of the questions we asked them is based on this, their experience with remote education during the pandemic, do you think high school students will now expect colleges to have better technolo technological capabilities than they do today? Um, so let's find out. Milan, why don't we go to the next slide? 
answer is yes, 92%. Uh, so, uh, so this is a clear sign uh, that many institutions, uh, you know, basically see they need to up their game, I think. Um, and I, I want to put here that this is not just about learning technologies. That's a key, key part of this, I think. But in the comments um, that accompanied this survey and our reporting also that accompanied the survey, you know, it's also about their entire IT infrastructure. Um, part of that is Wi-Fi access, certainly, um, but also sort of the, the student experience of, uh, in general when it comes to how they interact with different aspects of the institution online. You know, navigating various portals, navigating various interactions they have with, uh, say, financial aid and other places. So there's this big emphasis right now to try and create a better UX, user experience, a seamless experience when it comes to uh, how colleges interact with their students uh, online. But when it comes to learning, I think one of the big areas that we heard a lot about, and we heard this from students as well, um, is consistency across learning platforms. Um, that's an area they felt like they would go to one class uh, and where they felt like it, it was very consistent and the level of interactivity um, really worked for them. And then they go to another class and it would be very different when it came to the virtual component. And it felt to them very much like um, that this inconsistency was hurting their learning. So that's something we heard as well. I think something a lot of institutions are thinking about, about building that consistency for students when it comes to um, the platform, so be careful, you know, there's some of this is decided by the own faculty member, but some of it consistency in terms of learning management systems and things like that across especially larger institutions is something that I know they are looking at. So going to the next slide, we asked uh, respondents to pick from a list of technologies or sort of tech infused approaches to identify not just where they saw growth and opportunity, but where they saw really need. So here's how you know we phrase this very specifically. These are the top five picks for the areas they, the respondents thought, are the most important to the future of their institution. And I pulled out two comments here um, from uh, anonymous comments we had from respondents. And so you know, hybrid and online learning topped the field uh, with a combined 54% of the vote. Um, and I do think it's probably worth noting the the other areas just quickly here. Uh, OER and adaptive courseware are also, you know, very much part of how you teach and what you offer students in the online learning space and learning space in general, I should say. Um, and of course, cybersecurity is, is a paramount issue with the rise of ransomware attacks in colleges, but perhaps a, a discussion for another time. But again, I think this is really interesting to see where people think the most important uh, areas they need to focus on for the future success of their institution at. And the next slide is going to reinforce that as well. So where technology investments are most needed on your campus to better serve future students? Again, it's about teaching. It's about online, in-person, or a mix of both. Um, I think that's also, again, reinforcing this idea that there's an expectation that things are going to have to change, and that each institution is going to have to figure out what's the right mix for it. Um, was it all fully online degree programs uh, as part of their mix? At, at what level, graduate or undergraduate? Is it programs where the, there's more of a hybrid, where there's some asynchronous material provided and then in-classroom experience is very much focused on interaction with the students and peer group interaction? Or is it sort of this, this high flex model, which really is teaching both to students at home at the same time you're teaching to a, a live classroom in front of you? So a couple different models there. Um, so next slide, please. So, you know, this is also not about just monetary investment. It's an investment of time, as you all are here in some ways. Uh, it's about training. Um, and here's where you see that training is perhaps best focused. It's best focused, people think, at least the, the slim majority here, uh, on faculty. But I want to be careful here about painting a picture of, say, recalcitrant faculty members who don't want to try new things. I'm sure many of you have had experiences of changing your teaching um, trying new things in the past year, if not before that. And we hear a lot about folks it's talking about the enthusiasm for new, trying new things in this space. Um, and I want to call out one professor we've heard from in part because he's a bit of a teaching guru, and that's Eric Mazur. Eric teaches uh, physics at Harvard, and he's been very much a, a strong uh, uh, supporter um, of active learning, sort of a general a, an idea that certainly I'm sure many of you know about, but basically trying to uh, trying to be create better engagement with the students, uh, working on peer to peer models, so the students are learning from each other, uh, improving uh, doing small projects. Um, and Eric was really skeptical uh, prior to the pandemic about online learning. He did not think his approach to active learning was going to work. 
a few uh, months ago, we had Eric on a, a virtual program. He said he thinks it's unethical for him to return to the way he taught before the pandemic. He thinks it does not serve his students well. He does not carry over some of the ideas that he found in the online classroom, um, prim primarily in the area of student engagement. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later and about what that may mean. But I thought that was striking that someone who was so sort of uh, um, supportive of in-person interactive learning at the highest level at Harvard University would say after the, after the pandemic, his experiences made him say it's unethical for him to return to his previous teaching practices. Um, I'm not sure his administrators agree yet necessarily, um, but I think it's an interesting example of where there really has been some change uh, in terms of how folks think about their teaching. So what's the biggest barrier? Let's go to the next slide here. Yeah, you know, it's not faculty reluctance. That's not the biggest barrier, it's money. Uh, I think probably no surprise here. Um, just to put some context around this, you know, higher ed has faced some serious budget constraints in, in the years uh, prior to the pandemic. It's faced increasingly difficult challenges around enrollment as demographics shift. Obviously, uh, public institutions fa have faced a real dis disinvestment from the public side. You know, federal stimulus money has helped a lot in this context. I, a lot of institutions have talked about how they see that that stimulus money not just keeping, uh, say, their doors open, but using that money to hopefully uh, within the strict rules that can can govern that money, but use that money to invest in things that are going to allow them to move ahead uh, and perhaps take advantage of this time. Um, and I would say in general, there was lots of dire predictions, including some of the Chronicle at the start of the pandemic. Uh, I, I think in general, we, those were not as dire as uh, were predicted. Higher education is probably in better shape now, but it's obviously been held up by this federal stimulus money. So there's still some uh, sense that there may be other shakeout in general, but obviously money here you know, is a, is a big factor in, in an institution's ability to change and how quickly it changes as well. So getting back to my original slide here, my original idea here, momentum intentions. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit more about those subheads uh, that I have under each of those big topics. So I mentioned it before, you know, hybrid and high flex, I think are really the most interesting things coming out. I think there are some institutions that are thinking more deeply about developing on, uh, fully online programs. Um, some of them see that as an ability to perhaps reach a different audience, reach a different uh, students. Um, that's a challenge. I think that really depends on your institution, how whole hog, there's some really big, some people expecting a lot more online programs to develop. There's some really big players in that market. And so I, I just I feel a little bit less uh, more skeptical about those programs really getting um, going really big right away at least. Um, but hybrid and high flex, meaning the the traditional in person classrooms and colleges that have relied on traditionally in person, um, finding new ways of making sure that material and, and mixing online material and online content uh, uh, with the in person experience. Again, high flex as it's defined is that learning experience in the classroom while also teaching. Um, to a remote uh, classroom as well. We've heard, uh, I'm sure, I wonder if you all would say the same thing. We've heard that's the hardest to do. It's the most complicated technologically and it's the most complicated pedagogically. Um, but we do see some folks who are really interested in that. So let me talk a little bit about that question about equity and access. Um, because that high flex model and perhaps others as well you know, we've heard from both community colleges and some large public regionals that, hey, it allows them, gives their students so much more flexibility. So I use that uh, example earlier about a student who is on campus who doesn't want to go to class. But, you know, let's expand it beyond just sort of this, this uh, stereotype of, of, a, of a lazy student, but to the idea of reaching adult students, right? This is where online education traditionally has um, aimed itself because it's flexibility, because it allows folks who are uh, working full time, who have childcare responsibilities, who have elder care responsibilities, who have tons of responsibilities, find a way to navigate that system uh, and still earn a degree. Um, but that's even being thought about even beyond that. So there's even just sort of a traditional, a non-traditional uh, students, those adult students, certainly a big place that where they think there's more access and flexibility that can be provided. But even so, I've heard examples of, of veterans uh, who may not feel comfortable in a big classroom with a lot of people around, for example, or the learning accommodations for students with uh, some learning disabilities, some learning challenges. This has been something that has really uh, grown quite a bit 
uh, during the pandemic. And, and so I feel like that's an area in which we see a lot of people talking about uh, more access and more availability and trying to make sure technology can continue there. But even those traditional places that have really thought about the, the living and learning community, small traditional uh, liberal arts institutions had said, hey, we've got some intro courses that are oversubscribed and that don't allow enough students to move through as quickly into their major as we would like. What if we open those intro courses up to not just students who can get into the classroom and limit the number of seats that literally exist in that classroom or the number that the professor wants to teach you, but to open them up and make them high flex. So a course comes in or a class comes in on one day and it's the full room is full and there's a room full of people back in their dorm watching the class and then that class switches and allows those intro courses to not be a, a bottleneck but allow them to open up more. So just one idea there that I know some classes are thinking about or some colleges are thinking about. Again, I get back to also uh, another area of, I think about is active learning. There's a lot of interest now that now that professors have probably recorded a lot more of their lectures um, to flip the classroom. So the traditional classroom approach now, instead of lecturing in the classroom, let the students watch the, watch the lectures at their speed, at their time, um, allow them to uh, take it in, in, in bits and bytes as opposed to a full hour lecture or what have you, and then use that time in the in-person classroom as just the, the time to have interaction, answer questions from the, the students, uh, and focus on, say, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, projects as well. Another area we're hearing a lot about is uh, student engagement. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier about Eric Mazur, but others have said it as well, that while virtual learning and, and the video conferencing platforms are, are not great sometimes, um, they really have facilitated sometimes better faculty student interaction. And I, I think the prime example of this is in, is in chat rooms or in, excuse me, in the, in the chat, um, where there's a sense that students who traditionally would not raise their hand in a classroom, who may not feel like they fit or feel like they should be there, they feel a safer space to interact using the chat, for example. And so that's one area in which um, I think a lot of teachers and professors are trying to think about how do I incorporate that in the in-person classroom potentially? Um, because it's not just about the introverts um, and folks who may like that. It also is a part of what we call inclusive teaching as well. So reaching out to students of color who traditionally may not feel as uh, welcomed or in, in the classroom in some ways, this has been a talk about, this may actually accelerate that as well, to think more about how do you create tools that allow all students to feel comfortable and to feel like they have a place in the classroom to raise ideas and to have that faculty interaction that is so important and is the heart of teaching, um, having that interaction with a faculty member. And I'll just add here, and I'm sure you all have thought, this, thought of this as well potentially, but faculty office hours. Um, I, I don't know how you all are thinking, but we've heard that the many, I've heard many faculty just say, I'm done with office hours that are not virtual that they just have worked so much better in the Zoom environment. People can pop in, pop out. Students feel more comfortable having those, inter those sessions. Doesn't mean you wouldn't throw away completely your in-person office hours, but the idea that you would just limit them to being face-to-face -face interactions is something that I'm really curious to see if that continues or not. Um, just quickly on the tensions, I wanna make sure that I hit a couple that I may have not have already but obviously, the, you know, there's a real concern about the digital divide that was shown so clearly during the pandemic that there really are equity gaps when it comes to access to uh, Wi-Fi broadband. Uh, certainly, um, having spaces in, in in your house uh, to have learning uh, available to do it remotely. So I think that's really important uh, to continue to figure out. Um, I certainly think there's also a lot of concern here about, and I'm gonna get to this idea of fatigue. Uh, and what I mean by that, in some sense, is the innovation fatigue. You know, we did part of our survey I was referencing earlier, everyone's been drinking from the technology fire hose, right? So 89% of the respondents of college administrators and faculty said they had to learn new tech skills during the pandemic. And I'm frankly, I think they should be higher. I think I can't imagine the 11% that didn't learn something about technology during the pandemic. But, you know, it really is the, the biggest challenge, I think, in terms of how you keep on moving forward when so many people have already ch made changes. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges, certainly, um, and as well as students, right? I want to make sure that that fatigue is not just about uh, work fatigue, but, you know, according to surveys of college presidents, students' mental health is their top concern, and that's very understandable. 
Um, so I really think that's an important thing to consider as part of all these conversations is faculty and student fatigue. How do you kind of keep moving forward uh, and make it work for your institution? And just one more bit uh, before we wrap up, because I want to hear your questions, is I want to have the final slide. There's a couple things I want to make sure we're, we're also uh, throw into the mix. You know, this is getting a little bit on the cutting edge a bit more, but uh, I, I think it's a trend that was coming before, which is machine learning and automation, artificial intelligence. This is something that, that many institutions are investing in when it comes to, say, chatbots that allow for nudges to students to, say, fill out their federal application. Um, but it's coming in the classroom as well. Um, it's coming very quickly into sometimes it's automated testing. It's courseware that adapts to how learners are learning or how they prefer to learn. Um, and so I think it's something that's going to be happening more and more. There obviously there, there are quite a bit of concerns about certainly letting the machines do the teaching. And the people who are proponents of this certainly don't think of it that way. They think of it as taking away some of the more mundane tasks and putting the human in the spot to do the, do the actual interaction. But I would say that's an area that's going to continue to grow quite a bit in the years ahead. You know, but at the same time, as we do more of these types of teaching, um, using different types of technology tools, we're also collecting a lot of student data. Um, some of that student data is being used to prepare uh, better interventions to make sure that students will persist and have success in college and will move their, all the way to graduation. Um, but obviously, with those concerns about collecting data, there's concerns about privacy. Um, I think there's one of the big areas that came out during COVID was uh, remote proctoring, right? There was these models, there's these uh, programs that were set up by some companies and some others to proctor exams. Um, they use pretty intrusive uh, uh, tools to do that in terms of monitoring keyboard, monitoring interaction, monitoring the camera of the student. Um, lots of concerns came out about that. And a lot of institutions are talking about, hey, how do we think about uh, the data that we're collecting about students and their privacy? How are we talking to students about that? going forward. Um, even in some cases, some institutions are developing student data officers as well. And finally, something that uh, I think you all are, are well familiar with, but I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, and that's remote work. Um, you know, some say might say the pandemic kind of opened up the Pandora's box here for higher ed, because unlike the corporate world in, in, in most sense, you know, higher ed hasn't really wrestled with how to provide a, robo a robust remote work option and defined HR policies around it. This is really focused on staff, less so than faculty. Um, and obviously some staff require functions, you know, you have to be on campus, they require a direct connection to students. But you do see some areas where there's lots of questions about how you set the right policies uh, for your campus. Um, and also in places like uh, uh, information technology. So you see that a lot of turnover, frankly, in the IT space and campuses in part because of many institutions, many other um, because companies who are looking for good IT personnel are offering remote work, but you can work from anywhere. Um, and so this is some, one area I know that uh, some institutions are trying to figure out what's the right policy uh, in that space as they look to a future where remote work will be an option for many more employees potentially from, at different um, types of institutions. Um, I just do want to point out quickly in the, in the blue over here, these are Chronicle resources. Uh, that's a link to all of our virtual forums. Many of them touch on these topics and other topics. Also, our Chronicle store. We have done some reports on student data. We've done reports that touch on machine learning. We've done reports that touch on the future of remote work. So those are just a couple places for us to, um, to if you want to see uh, further uh, discussions about these, uh, you might be able to access those. Um, so I want to open this up to questions and comments. What did I frame correctly? Uh, where am I off base? I'd love to hear from you all, what, what's the momentum and tension for, uh, for you all in this space? And, and to be clear, uh, yes, I am a journalist, but we're on background here today, I'm not writing an article. So please feel free to be frank and candid. You know, thank you very much for listening. Malan, thank you for running the slides. And I'm worried my camera is not working, but technology is always a challenge. So I appreciate you all listening to me today. Thanks very much. Uh -huh. Uh, so on behalf of the provost and Mike and, and everybody at Seton Hall, I just want to uh, say thank you to Ian. Um, uh, we didn't want to break it to you early uh, that your camera wasn't working. Uh, so the glitch in the slides was Milan inserting your your picture into your slides so people uh, could put it in. actually see a face with the name. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. I'm sorry with my, I will try and reboot my camera here. But of course, this is the technology challenge we're talking about. So 
Well, and 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 that and that's I think that's the perfect experience that we all we all share over the over the last 20 months or so. And and while everybody's thinking of their questions, I don't see any raised hands yet. So hopefully we'll get them. Um, I do have a question of my own, but uh, I I think just going through the the slides and and the survey and and some of the data that you've collected, we can certainly tell that we're not alone. Uh, many people are dealing with uh, with lots of the same issues. We struggled and continue to struggle with remote proctoring. Uh, the digital divide is uh, coming back into focus, I think is one of the positives um, of, of the pandemic be because it sort of disappeared from the, the landscape for, for a long time. Um, and, and I think every faculty member on the call uh, could probably give a um, both a story about the digital divide and a story about a student who was just wanted to take class in their pajamas that day, dialing in from, from the dorm room. Um, so I, I don't know who put up their hand first, so I'm, I'm just going to go um, with Betty and, uh, and let Betty ask her question. Hi, thank you very much. That was a really great uh, presentation. What I just wanted to add was sort of feedback um, that our, oh, I can put my camera on now, okay. Um, so, so some feedback that I just wanted to share that um, as I'm listening to your presentation and a lot of the, the data that you collected from feedback, um, it was sort of reminiscent of a lot of the things that we have encountered during the pandemic. And um, my role at Seton Hall is I'm the Assistant Dean for Interprofessional Education and Operations. So I saw both end of this. And I have to say that it actually helped to alleviate some of the barriers we had, especially with um, interprofessional type of activities where we had space issues in the past and how do we get people together? We found that that was, um, it turned out to be a good thing, especially because of all the great support we had here at Seton Hall to be able to quickly transition over to a virtual platform and to be able to successfully um, uh, continue with our programming and also incorporating um, some external partners that work with us. So that was one piece. Um, and the last thing, the other thing that I wanted just to say to sort of validate what you're talking about here is that um, we also saw uh, an issue with cost. Uh, one of the programs, mm -hmm. our physician assistant program, as Paul knows, we had we had meetings about this in their their need or pr their preference to use some AI, but some of the difficulties and the cost that was involved that was very prohibitive. Um, and sort of add a little bit more stress, but this, again, our faculty are great and they worked around it, uh, but definitely is, a, is an issue. Yeah, certainly, Betty, I appreciate that. And certainly cost is a huge issue for a lot of these things, right? Um, and depending on how far down, the, how many tools you want to use and how you want to do it. And, and certainly um, it's, as I mentioned, that, that, one, that one slide we have about the budget being the clear Challenge. I think not surprising, but I think that many institutions are thinking that are how you do that and, and how you make those investments strategically. Um, like I said, there's a lot of hope that you can kind of leapfrog forward um, by making some smart investments that are going to outlast not just the pandemic, but um, how do you do that on the tight budget is obviously the key question. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, Martin Edwards is up next. Martin should be able to unmute now. Yeah. Okay. Thank. All right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm not just a person in a box. Um, <laughs> this is actually an AI. Um, exactly. Uh, so Ian, thank you for the for that great overview. There's a lot for us to chew on here, and I think that this is really important that we took the time um, on a Friday morning when none of us really have anything to do. Uh, <laughs> but to, to begin the process of sort of chewing on some of these issues, I guess my question to you is um, in the surveys or, or in the conversations that you've had, how have universities wrestled with the governance of all of these things? I mean, because you could imagine there's sort of yes. two ideal types here, one being kind of a very top down, this is what we're going to do, and that inevitably encounters resistance, but one also being kind of a bottom up in which every single unit tries to adopt a different system and then that causes a whole lot of headaches for folks like Paul and you know units decide no no, no we, we're going to all use max effective immediately or something like that I mean exactly um, so how are how are you seeing units talk about the governance of these decisions and and who's making those decisions and how ought they best be made 
Thanks. Yeah, I want to be careful. I, yeah, Martin, I think it's a great question and it really gets at the heart of it, of, of what requires change management. Um, and certainly we saw this before the pandemic as well, but we hear a lot about the tension and getting back to those tensions and momentum, but the, the tension between the fact that institutions feel like they have to move quickly on this, but obviously in, universities, one of their strengths is, and one of their, their base fundamental values is shared governance. Uh, with the faculty and how you make sure you're moving forward in the right way as the institution thinks about, again, the provost idea, the value proposition. So I wish I could say, here's exactly how everyone's doing, because it's always going to be different. But there is, I would just say, we hear that a lot about that tension between the institution wanting to make some changes uh, from the, the administrators. And while faculty sometimes are reluctant or faculty saying, hey, we want to move forward and feeling like the administration is not listening to them. I would say that in general, what, the, you know, certainly the the model that seems to be people say when it, when it does work is saying, hey, we're gonna set some standards here or we're gonna set some guidelines for what we expect in the classroom. We're not gonna tell you how to teach because that's not our job as administrators. We're not gonna tell you, you have to use this tool, but we're gonna try and make sure that you know, you're aware of it. And certainly in a very standard sort of innovation um, disruption type talk and buzzwordy things that the Harvard Business Review talks about. Um, you know, you find some folks who are really excited about trying to do something in the faculty and you give them the tools to go have fun with it. And then you connect those faculty to the folks who are kind of saying, well, I don't know, I, you know, I'm not sure, I'll try, I'm not sure it's right for my class. And you have them talk to each other because um, no administrator is going to convince a faculty member that what's right for their teaching. Another faculty member might convince another faculty member. It's the, the general type. I want to be careful here about overgeneralization. Again, we are looking at the 40,000 foot view from the Chronicle. So it is that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, again, at the faculty level, trying to get some faculty who are interested in, and who have adopted things prior to the pandemic, uh, who have done training or really found some excitement, exciting about it and moving it forward. We've heard a lot of folks um, find ways they can go and, and just have a, a informal chat room or with, among faculty or a, a weekly or monthly newsletter that collects, hey, here's what I learned by doing this in my, in my classroom. You all probably have something similar to be sure and this forum probably is, is you know an extension of that in some sense so it's just trying to raise up as much um again while setting some policy and some goals perhaps as an institution for making sure that the experience for students i think again is key is consistent across different platforms um if you are you, you all may just use the same platform but you know what are the goals what are uh, of what are you trying to aim for when it comes to that student interaction what do you in during a class what are the things you think are the most important tools that are out there, but also what do you think that is at sort of the base level that everyone should be kind of trying to hit? I think that's the approach that I'm hearing um, work for the most part. But I think, again, it's always going to depend on your institution and the, the people that make it up. So it looks like we have a question in the chat from Chelsea. Um, Chelsea, I don't know if you, you want to go on uh, on audio or if you want me to read it. Um, I, I can I can read it. Uh, so it, Chelsea says, I'm not sure if you would know this offhand, but you mentioned that college administrators and faculty thought that there needed to be training in labs and other research activities, 5%. Do you know what those research activities involved? Mm, I'd have to look back at what specifically, Chelsea, you were mentioning. I'm trying to think in terms of training in labs and other research activities. I mean, I do think there is this um, sort of a side, con different conversation. We actually had a session on this yesterday uh, at the Chronicle uh, Forum about um, research in, in general, um, meaning that there's just some automation has come because of COVID to, uh, to running labs. There's been some more efficiencies created in terms of collaboration. Uh, in terms of research. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think training and how do you kind of work on uh, the um, ways to take advantage of doing some of that work virtually. Uh, things that you may not have thought. Obviously there are wet labs and things like that that really, you know, it was very hard to figure that out in terms of research, but some institutions did. And some institutions see a lot more data sharing going on, for example, having a better data repository. Um, and um, there's just, there is some interest there about how do you kind of figure out how do you run the labs a little bit more virtually? Is there ways to create them more efficient? Is there ways to get researchers focused on processing and thinking about uh, the big questions and the, they're really at the heart of their research rather than thinking about research operations and research pre uh, procedures and processes? 
Um, I know it's still pretty vague, but uh, I think that's what we're getting at in that one five percent question or answer. So while we're waiting for my my colleagues to think of other questions, I'll ask one of mine. Um, on, on slide number eight uh, from the survey, you you asked uh, people uh, about what was the most important to the future success of the institution, adaptive course, uh, adaptive courses, hybrid learning, thing, things like that. And I'm just wondering if there was any distinction made or, or do we have any anecdotal data about the difference, differences between undergraduate and graduate education, which I, I think is a theme that, that you hit on. Um, but, but if there, there is a distinction to go um, certain ways based on the level of education. Oh, great point, Paul. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't asked, I don't think enough about that. And we didn't ask in that particular survey where, say, where do you think innovation is most needed at the graduate level in terms of technology or just in terms of teaching practices in general. I do think it's an important conversation. It's coming up. We focus primarily on the undergrad. I mean, at the, at the grad level, I mean, it's just a couple of thoughts. Um, there is and has been, especially by some smaller institutions to say, hey, maybe more graduate level and professional level work is better for full online programs. This is not a new idea. You know, this was a, an idea uh, that's been out there for a while, just the sense that, hey, these many, these folks, maybe adults or older uh, folks may have other obligations. And so, but we do hear more institutions um, talking about online graduate programs. Um, it's usually for, and sometimes for smaller colleges, it's means as a way to help prop up the undergraduate side. And I expect that to continue. Um, I think it's gonna be a crowded market though. Um, just to say, there's another trend happening here. There's a lot more uh, concern about graduate education right now. There's been some recent reporting about uh, where your graduates end up in terms of debt. Um, so I think that's going to combine it with it as well. What's most efficient, uh, what's most uh, cost optimal for those folks uh, as well. And it Thank really you. depends, you know, once you get to the graduate level, sorry, it depends also on sort of the disciplinary, which is almost more so than at the undergrad. And I, I'm one of you, some of you might take umbrage with that, but um, I think it's something that we at the Chronicle probably should figure out a little bit more because we've been so focused on the undergraduate side on some of these conversations. Thank you. Uh, now we have three questions. I think Mike came up first. I'll uh, I'll wait till others ask their questions. Okay. So Marianne, you have the ball. Well, I saw that my new colleague who does media and psychology work put her hand up. So I think Dr. Coyle should go next. <laughs> Just passing the baton around, um, but thank you, Marianne. Um, so I thought it was very interesting how a lot of um, a notable amount of those surveyed said that they were interested in taking virtual classes or at least hybrid classes, but a very small percentage felt that colleges were doing this effectively. So. I'm sort of wondering what is the ultimate goal of wanting to take these classes, but not really feeling like they're being done efficiently. It's Great hard question. on our end also, as I always like to have multiple options for students to gain participation points virtually and in person, but you don't know the student's motivation for going virtual always. You don't know if it's just because of having COVID symptoms or having sure. a mental health crisis or having some other obligations or if they just aren't up for it. So it's sort of, I guess it's more two questions. One, how do we get students to feel that we're giving them an option that's actually effective for their learning process, but also how do we try and get faculty to not put their own assumptions into thinking why someone might be going virtual and still treating them as someone who is still interested in and invested in learning? What a great question. Um, I'm not going to have any answers necessarily, but I think that's really important. I, I think you pointed out something which I wish I had kind of raised, and you make a great point. Why do they have, from our one survey, I'm always going to keep on uh, cautious about overgeneralizing, but why in our survey do, does it seem that high school students have a this potentially growing preference, that's what we think it is, for online or hybrid learning, but don't think it's going to be done, being, being done very well at the higher education level? You know, I wish in some ways we may have dug deeper on some of those questions, and because you know, asking why they think that or what are they reading that makes them think that um, I think is key. And, and to your point, the, the, your larger questions about uh, why a student is going on, you know, prefers one way or the other and finding it out what I think is, is 
is really a good one. Um, and so I, I don't know that I have any answers for you, except to say those are the key questions I think that will help us at the Chronicle also think about how do we dig deeper into this and what it means. Thank you. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Sylvia, and then we'll go back to Marion and, and Mike and no, no tossing the ball this time. Uh, one of the big challenges some of us experienced was conducting exams online. This was mentioned briefly earlier. Remote proctoring was particularly difficult and sometimes ineffective in controlling academic dishonesty. Uh, any comments on this and future directions on how this can be um, improved? Uh, I'll add there that it was very costly to the university to do this um, on the scale that we had to do it as well. So any any comments on, on how this gets better in the future? Yeah, it's tough. Um because we've heard institutions certainly similar wrestling with this in terms of how you do the online proctoring. Um, and it it leads to a conversation. I did have a virtual forum where I brought in some folks who are experts on uh, academic on, on academic integrity um, and how you prevent cheating in this in this time. They wouldn't frame it that way as how do you prevent cheating because they want to talk about how do you sort of support academic integrity. So it's a little bit of a different mind frame. Mm -hmm. But it is tough. I think they would sort of also talk about, hey, let's de-escalate. It gets into this conversation about de-escalating these really high stakes uh, exams, for example, um, that and this, again, we talk about trends that are sort of accelerated before COVID. This is one of those trends that existed before COVID that is sort of an effort to take, you know, think, rethink grades, rethink assessment, rethink evaluation, and certainly rethink testing. So you know, part of what these academic integrity officers were saying, hey, we need to think, what, why is it so high stakes? Um, this doesn't mean that proctoring, proctoring online is bad, but what is it that the pressures are on the students so much that they may have to go feel like they have to cheat? Um, and so I, I'm not sure how much it's better it's going to get in terms of the actual online proctoring technology. Uh, I think the companies that do some of that work uh, were clearly uh, having their feet held to the fire and are trying to think about better and being smarter about it and also about smarter how they communicate it and also working more with faculty to talk about, hey, um, here's how it should work. Because I don't think proctoring is going to go away, or excuse me, I don't think exams are going to go away, right? And some 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 courses require it more. And I don't want to say it's oh, you can just go to low stake quizzes and you'll still get the same type of evaluation. Sometimes it's required for certification, right? There's no way to get away from it. Um, so I want to be clear, it's not as easy as it may be sounding. But I think I, I guess I'm a little optimistic that people have heard that this was a real challenge. And I think I guess I would just say the key thing is bring students in to talk to them, your own students to talk about, hey, did it work for you? Here's how it works. Being really upfront. About what it requires and making sure some of those really onerous things like tracking eye movement on a camera which is what they did uh are explained or at least or maybe even gotten rid of um allowing students to maybe leave for a few minutes and come back maybe think about hey maybe some of this can be open book i don't know those are tougher questions i think for you all to have to then i can answer easily but i guess I, I like to think that because it was such a heated discussion and a heated moment i mean members of congress got involved <laughs> um not to say that's going to provide clarity, but you know, <laughs> they are. I think the sense that the, but the, I would say some of the companies definitely heard that and are trying to think better about it, how they go for it. And and I would say they're not going to be. It's not, definitely they're not going to be abandoned, right? Online proctoring is here to stay in many ways. Um, sorry, I'm kind of the other places to look are to traditionally online institutions. So I did talk to some at the University of Maryland Global Campus or uh, Southern New Hampshire University, Western Governance University, these institutions that have have run very robust online programs and have been thinking about uh, proctoring uh, online for a long time. Um, they have some some different thoughts and models that perhaps are more traditional institutions may want to look to. Um, so that's just one, one idea, perhaps. Thank you. Marianne? Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that you had four children in elementary school working remotely. I do have a question as well, but that's thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. As uh, they are actually, uh, and some of them are home today because one of them is sick, so we're trying to be careful. So, uh, but they're not bothering me. You know. Good luck. Um, <laughs> so maybe, and maybe I should have read closer to the schedule. I, I have sort of a question that's uh, more tied in specifically to Seton Hall and our strategic plan. Um, and just sort of how we can navigate, I think, what are some inherent tensions? I like all of the goals. Goal three is to create a premier student experience. Um, goal one is about me being a more effective researcher. I can do some scholarship of teaching and learning that brings that together, but my heart in a lot of ways is in my memory research. So as you think about how institutions are trying to be amazing at everything at all times, 
how do we learn to better prioritize? And secondly, when, at least for me, the danger is that I get the dopamine rush of helping a student really quickly that just sent me an email and needs help. Whereas I don't get a dopamine rush from grueling away at a, a paragraph um, when the data turned out a little murky and I got to sell it. Did you stump in? No, I'm thinking it through. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's what hard, you're it's at, hard when we can't see you. I mean, it, it's a great example of when uh, of of that tension between research and and teaching, right? Um, and I, I do think that's something that I mean, obviously, again, that tension existed in many ways before. I mean, in multiple ways beforehand. But I do know, say, institutions who are, are both being ambitious with their research agenda and also want to continue a very big access mission where their students have a lot of interaction with the faculty. And the faculty have said, okay, hold it. Yes, you can, you know, we think you can maintain both, but you have to think about this diligently. Um, you have to think about this in, in, in a way that we can do this. And I'm, I'm specifically thinking of, I'm not gonna name it, but a conversation I've had with a, a recent institution became an R1, a public institution in Virginia, it became an R1. And then, and they are thinking about also expanding into online more. Um, because they also have an access mission, they feel like that's very strong. And so, how do you, how do you make sure that both are being met and pushing? And, and honestly, for the most part, the generality is, and I don't know how you all feel, research wins because tenure and promotion and all the incentives are geared towards that. Uh, I'd be careful, you know, for the most part, right? That's usually the, what we hear is that those those tenure and promotion um, incentives, those rewards, are all primarily geared toward research and what you hear is people trying to bring teaching up to the same level um and how you do that in a way and of course you also hear this sort of dovetails a little bit with teaching faculty that is faculty who are, who are primarily not doing research but who are on, on, on a sort of a teaching track um because this is also connected to contingent faculty right um trying to create better tracks different tracks of professional development for folks who are really focused on uh, on that teaching experience and making sure it feels as rewarded, incentivized as someone who is primarily thought of as a researcher, even though they may have some teaching responsibilities. Um, I hope that helps, but I think that's sort of, I mean, the larger sort of bigger level is sort of thinking about those rewards, promotion and, and incentive practices um, around tenure and other things. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so there's there's two questions on the board. Mike still has his and and Betty has another one. Um, oh, and, and Karen, and I just want to be a little cognizant of Ian's time. Um, so the, the, those will probably be the last three. All right, so you want me to go there, yeah. Paul? Yeah. All right, so Ian, I, I guess my question is, um, looking at this from, you know, from, from kind of my, my bias as an environmental studies professor, um, I get frustrated that uh, as a society, we tend to ignore existential threats that are far off in the distance, like climate change, yet we rapidly respond to um, emergencies in a very effective way with a lot of resources. But then once those emergencies are over, like a wildfire or a flood, uh, we go back to, to business as usual. And my, that's my fear with higher ed and the, the pandemic, is that we made a massive pivot we took on a lot of new things. And I'm afraid that the same existential threats that we were worried about before, the demographic cliff, the threat of professionalization to the liberal arts, you know, mm. the, the things that have been out there for a long time, um, that if we do go back to address those, we already have our tool set pre-made and it's gonna be the pandemic tool set because that's how we responded effectively to an emergency. So with that kind of as the context, I, I guess, in your position in talking to administrators and to faculty, um, has there been a beginning of a discussion about how we get back to thinking about the future of higher ed um, in that broader context and get out of an emergency mindset? Yeah, in, in many ways, we framed a lot of what we thought we'd be producing this fall around that. And guess what happened? Um, you all know what happened. And so, you know, not to say that we're solely focused on the, um, hey, how is Delta playing out on campuses, but um, it is hard to get away from the crisis. And I hear you. And I think you all, again, I think you all having this conversation, trying to facilitate some conversation, be looking out five years is smart. Um, there is a, you know, I have had talked to some folks who think things are going to snap back because that's what higher ed does. And the, and the best 
example, and because there is no good example, because this is unprecedented, but after the Great Recession, there was a lot of talk about how do you change higher ed? So it is enrolling different types of students, reskilling more students, sort of a very different area of conversation in some sense, though it's related. But you really saw a bunch of programs that started with that in mind to get canceled after that. And you didn't see a change from some advocates' point of view of, of, a real, of the changes that were promised, um, even when he has places like uh, the Obama administration pushing for changes and things like that. So I think there is a real concern that there's gonna be a snapback. Um, and, and to your point, there are some of these bigger, broader, less defined uh, challenges like the demographic, demographic cliff, changes in enrollment. Um, I would say, you know, other things that people are not paying attention to as much is the, this rise in what we kind of call alternative providers, um, coding boot camps, places where people can get certification. I mean, Google and Amazon offering their own certification. Uh, the rise in the number of uh, especially technology employers, but others who are starting to say a college degree is not required to apply to more positions. Those are some pretty big threats in some ways if, if they grow. Um, and thinking the, about those, I think is, is hard for higher ed in, in, in many ways, because I think the, the yeah, it, it's understandable, right? You don't want to keep on changing. And getting back to that fatigue, I think it's hard to change and continue that change with so much uncertainty going on. Um, but obviously, it, it remains a real dynamic space. It was before, right? It's not like, a, you know, this is some of this new information. It's all uh, old in some ways. It's just kind of making sure that you're continuing to think and change. And again, getting back to that point of the tension, because you do want to hold on to some core values about what it is that makes your institution what it is, especially, you know, hey, a religious institution, right? Uh, you all know, and you want to hold on to those values while also changing. And I think it's a hard proposition for many institutions. Thank you. Okay, let, last question is from Betty. Hi again. Pressure's on, I guess. So um, my, now I have a, a question, not a feedback comment. So if we look at all of this that we're talking about and looking at it from the perspective of a value-added model, right? Sure. Um, we're teaching the, we're teaching students as part of their learning. They're they're learning those those, those hard skills, right? That they need um, and we're trying to provide them. So, you know, as an institution, whatever learning methods um, we're utilizing is we're trying to, I guess, enhance um, their employability to meet um, employer and labor market uh, needs, for example, if you think of it from that value perspective. Yeah. If a student is coming to our institution, their expectation is what the, the investment, the financial and the, and the time investment that they're making when they're done, they're going to get this really great job that they're going to have their own personal satisfaction, but also be able to to make a good living and have an impact in some way. So uh, in sort of tying this into what we're talking about now, um, there have been so many great opportunities. Um, COVID keeper, I like that, that you used that came out of this pandemic, some positive things. But then I wonder you know, how much focus um, as part of this value added model are we also considering the impact of virtual learning on the development of the soft skills that are so mm -hmm. important to meet those labor market needs to function as part of a team and, you know, communication, um, developing emotional intelligence and, you know, being able to figure out like conflict resolution. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel like during meetings, any type of classes, it seems that there's a tendency of people to just turn their cameras off, right? Mute themselves and just sort of listen passively. And I think there's such value in, in seeing that um, that body language, the facial expressions and that communication. So so what do you have any thoughts um, or have you um, gotten any other feedback from other universities um, that this is a, a major concern or this is like a new area to, to start to look into and develop as we develop the technology to also develop how we could instill this um, this aspect of learning? Great question. Yes, we have. I mean, um, again, another another trend that was certainly happening before the pandemic uh, that is it has been accelerated and really, as you really well point out, Betty, has changed, right, because of the virtual aspect of both learning, but also what employers are going to be doing in the future. So to your back to your, your base point, we have surveyed employers. I wish I had the data in front of me. I don't. I'm happy to share it with you later. But we did a survey. It was, it was time before the pandemic, but then it came out. We were surveying folks during the pandemic, so we altered it a little bit. Sorry. These were hiring managers. So we 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 surveyed hiring managers across the country last year. And not surprising, yes, soft skills are huge, right? We knew that beforehand. Um, but to your point, they really saw an increase in 
they think the pandemic's gonna accelerate that need for understanding of other people, for, uh, for being able to handle difficult situations and manage situations. And then there's this twist of it, but also be able to do that potentially remotely um, while still making sure that those folks have the ability to interact, conflict, uh, resolve conflicts in person or through this medium. Um, so really complicated. So something I think that, that in, in institutions have been thinking about how to instill soft skills. I think there's a, you know, it's a, one of those phrases that means different things to different people. I think, I think high school or colleges sometimes think they're, they're, they're instilling soft skills and then employers say, well, that's not what we need um, exactly. And so how do you define the soft skills is a challenge as well uh, to, make, to, to bridge that gap. How much colleges should teach that? Because sometimes it may not be, you know, certainly there are certain aspects like critical thinking, um, but there may be some other ones that may not feel as, as, as much part of the college curriculum. Um, so I do think uh, that is, is really important. I do think there's going to be also um, thinking about what the needs of our employers as they change, certainly to say virtual internships. This is slightly different, but there's going to be more, there's going to be different opportunities out there for students to have some sort of um, uh, some experience really, really leaving college. And we do think things like virtual internships is going to be, it's not my phrase, but I'll, I'll say I'll act like I made it up, a COVID keeper, right? We're going to see more of those types of things. Um, so that's a bit of a rambling answer, but I do think soft skills are going to remain important. That building, continuing to build that connection between what students are learning in college and what employers need and how far to go, right? I don't think colleges have to go. I mean, there they're may some of these just drawing these lessons out in a way and calling them out as opposed to changing your curriculum. I don't want to suggest that, but it is going to be something increasing. And we do see, again, employers feeling like, hey, we don't get enough of this. Um, and adding to that, they want to see different tech skills sometimes, or just some, I wouldn't say tech skills, uh, digital literacy, uh, digital competency, um, being able to approach data is a huge thing, right? Data, especially uh, having some, I mean, we see this in journalism, but in all types of liberal arts where they say you have to understand data better um, mm -hmm. in order because we have so much more data at our fingertips. Um, so again, a, a lot of different things I would just say, so it's going to be soft skills plus these digital skills that are, and that's just going to continue to roll into one um, and think about these, I'm not sure I want to say this phrase, but digital soft skills. How do you do a good meeting? How do you, you know, interact? How do you kind of get, you know, I'm not sure colleges have to teach that, but I think they have to be prepared that maybe something employers are asking more for. That's great. Ian, uh, again, on, on behalf of the university and, and, and everybody here and, and Dr. Passerini, thank you for, for spending the time with us. It's, it's always comforting to know that you know, others are as concerned about these things as we are, and, and we're, we're not um, sort of off on a, on a path or, or missing something that, that we really should be focused on. I, I, I think uh, the conversation, the, the presentation has sparked motivation in us to sort of prioritize, which is, uh, you know, what do, what do we want to try to address? What's the most important thing to, to address? I think many times, um, like every other school and, and, and college, we, we get... Uh, we get focused on trying, I can't remember, I think it might've been Marianne uh, who said, we try to do everything all at once and, yeah. and we try to do it all well. So I, I think, uh, you know, taking a lot of the data and a lot of the, the questions and answers that came up today and figuring out what's the most important for the university to focus on um, immediately and, and then uh, charting ourselves a path to eventually address them all. So, so again, I, 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 on behalf of everyone, thank you for, for taking the time uh, to talk to us today. Yeah, no, appreciate the invitation. Appreciate learning from all of you. Appreciate all of you rolling with my own tech challenges. Um, and I, I'm happy to, uh, I'll provide some information, but you can also provide everyone my email address um, in terms of following up if there's something you were interested in hearing more about um, or just letting me know your experience or, hey, again, letting me know what your questions are because the more I know what faculty and administrators are asking, the better we know that we're aligning the content that we provide in the right way. So that this is where this is very helpful for us um, because we don't, like I said, we don't have the answers. We're just interested in making sure we're asking the right questions of everyone so people can learn from us. So I uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you again. And just, just to boost your credibility. Thank um, you. You, you, did, you did not have a technical problem. We can see your video on yes. an iPad or a phone. Uh, we just, <laughs> for some reason, can't on the, uh, on, on the regular PC. Climate. All right, so everyone change their devices so you can see. Yes. <laughs> well, like Mike said, it's an emergency, and we can figure that out.
right? Yeah. We, we could do that very quickly. You so, can all get my so photo in your email. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank so, you. And you're welcome to uh, to stay to stay on the next uh, the next part of the uh, of the event for today, and we'll make this as short as as long as we as as we'd like. Is we we did ask two of our faculty to join Mike in a in a panel. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Marianne Lloyd, professor in the Department of Psychology. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Marianne on a lot of different fronts unrelated to technology. Uh, you know, the thing that that uh, stands out in my mind besides the chat about our kids is that she is a stalwart champion of, of our students. And I wrote that before her dopamine comment uh, uh, about getting the high when when helping students. So uh, I'm glad I was I was spot on um, our second panelist who who's uh, joined us uh, a, a little late, but I'm glad that she's here is uh, Lori Will, Dr. Lori Will, Assistant Professor in the Department of Undergraduate Nursing. I've also had the pleasure of working with Lori on, on several committees. Um, she's always uh, looking to make great use of how technology can uh, can help engage our students, dive deeper into content, and, and overall just make for a better student experience. Uh, Mike Mike is our is our third panelist. I've already boosted his ego for the day. Um, so uh, you know we we thought we we would open it up uh, while people think uh, um, about questions for for the for the faculty from from Seton Hall. Um, we're gonna we're gonna spark the conversation a little bit. Our first question goes to Marianne, um, and so we're, we're asking Marianne to speak briefly about the academic vision of the strategic plan and the role that technology may may play in it and how it may may foster its achievements. I'm sure, you didn't mean to say the advising vision, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll talk about that too. But how are <laughs> things different? <laughs> um, per my question earlier, so sorry, and what role technology can play? So I found myself taking a lot of notes uh, during Ian's Ian's talk, and I should have asked for this question in advance. This feels like a tenure interview, but I have <laughs> tenure, so um, so you know, I really think I sort of got at this earlier with my question, which is that you know this the and what Mike's comments were earlier about that we need to think beyond the emergencies of today. And I think that there are some places that this is happening and the technology can bolster it, but I think it's really important that um, we make that the, uh, uh, well, you can choose what you add to your salad to make it fun, right? That you make it the sunflower seeds or the croutons or the cheese, but it's not the kale um, or romaine or mixed green, whatever you like as your your base to get some nutrition in. And, and the first thing that I wrote, um, when I was taking notes was that we, we have to remember our mission and that uh, as a Catholic institution, we have uh, some level of a longer viewpoint, whether you wanna talk about that being historical looking back or if you know the faith part is of interest to you, the idea of eternal um, and the idea of love, I always think it's good to, to tag in there. So uh, when I think about what we wanna be as an academic institution, you're right, Paul, it's not. When you said the academic vision, I automatically started to think about, oh, right, we're R2 and what are we publishing? But that's not what the answer is supposed to be. The answer is supposed to be developing the mind, the heart, and the spirit of individuals, but also the people at the front of the classrooms, right? That the mind, heart, and spirits of the faculty and the staff, per that comment, do we really need to only let some people remote work one day a week? I'm not sure the answer to that is yes either. Um, so those are some, when I think about tech, I think about how it can enhance that. So Patrick Manning's contemplative pedagogy work that he just started last year, I think is a really great example of being able to bring tech in and allow that to happen. You know, I take a mindfulness class on Zoom on Thursday nights. Don't like to leave my house, right? I go to bed early, but that's a perfect way to get both. So I think that's one place uh, where technology can be fine as long as we learn to use it effectively and not um, impulsively, I think. Um, that's a great answer. So now we'll 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 ask Lori a question, and clearly we didn't uh, we didn't uh -oh. set this up. So hopefully uh, we we don't give her uh, uh, too big of a challenge, and I don't think we will. But um, Lori, maybe you can give us an idea. Now you know this twenty months. We all still feel like we're in twenty twenty. It's still March. Um, we're only gone for two weeks, and uh, you know. But now that we've been through all this, and we're in our our uh, fourth semester, I guess if you count the summer that we managed to do uh, very successfully after after going remote. 
Um, how do you think new technology might be infused uh, or impact nursing education, right? Uh, a, a discipline where there is a lot of soft skills and, and a lot of hands-on kind of, kind of training. So how do, you, how do you think technology will change the way we do that uh, now that so many faculty have sort of been forced into trying to figure it out uh, from a distance? Thank goodness that is a great question, Paul, that I actually can answer because I wanted Marianne's question. So unfortunately, I didn't really get to hear Ian's presentation because I was on a rank and tenure meeting that I left early. Um, so I didn't get the full benefit. But one thing that I did um, uh, was I able to think about is when we were talking about when Betty was talking about the soft skills and how important all of this is um, in nursing. And as a faculty, um, some of us do feel that the um, online or hybrid version, while very accommodating to some students, um, it kind of, um, for some, uh, makes them like more able to check out. And then we're not with them, so we can't really see if they understand or not. And I know when I stand in front of the classroom and I have 40 of them in front of me and I'm talking about a really hard concept like fluids and electrolytes and acid base balance. If they look at me blankly, I know that. And I'll be like, let me help you. Like, let, let me explain this a little bit better. So that's really a challenge. And I do understand why students, some of them want to be online and they voiced these concerns last semester and sometimes it's because they feel less anxious when they are in front of a um, crowd or a group of people but that's not good for nursing right because we have to be able to walk into our patient's room um, as students and as nurses and feel very comfortable in having conversations because it's all about uh, assessment of the patient and if we can't talk to them because we haven't learned how to do that um, that's a big problem because everything we do in nursing is based on our assessment skills and half of that is our physical assessment the other half is what the patient tells us right you know connecting those data points and clustering it together so I I see this as a quite a challenge in nursing when we were talking about online exams and proctoring <laughs> What a nightmare <laughs> that really was. In some of our nursing courses, we certainly can maybe reduce the stakes as Ian was talking about. Not everything has to be high stakes, but in a clinical course where you've got to kind of test their knowledge on fluids and electrolytes, it's important. Um, but maybe we can think about like different ways to do that if this is the way of the future. And I will say, I'm very proud of our faculty, um, some of whom, are older um, in their embrace of the technology. And when they couldn't do it, you know, those of us who love technology were able to pitch in and help. So um, there is certainly a um, place for it in a nursing program. What I would like to see, um, and I'm sure others might too, even though we relished the snow day um, now and again, what it really did was put us all behind. And in our nursing program, you know, like all programs, everything is jam packed. So I definitely think that has a place um, for us in, in terms of like one year we had flooding at IHS, um, you know, that could have been very useful for that. So I don't know if this is answering the question, but these are just some things that um, I was thinking about from our nursing program perspective. Great. Paul, can I, are we allowed yeah. to respond? Absolutely. Um, so, so I think what Lori starts to get at is that uh, what would be really helpful is to look at systemic issues instead of individual um, mm. fixing of the problem, right? And I wrote this down when we were kind of talking about like how great it is that an online class opens it up to, you know, students with childcare responsibility. Well, the other thing that would do that is subsidize national daycare so that you had coverage or elder care, right? So instead of asking the student to solve the problem or us moving to fix the student's problem or not ha needing to, you know, you could probably use some TAs that could do small oral exams so you don't have an academic integrity issue. Um, so I, I think it would be good if we can think, um, and maybe again, this is Mike's point, right? Not how am I supposed to fix this, but how can we, right? We are one Seton Hall. How can we, uh, we fix that? 
and more faculty might be part of the answer. I know we got more. I saw I read the provost now, just in case she listens to this part. Uh, but. We didn't get much more. <laughs> we were down a few lines and it's very stressful, um, but you're right. Um, the, the technology really does have a place to kind of help us um, open things up for sure. And you are right, Marianne, structural things are a very um, large issue that, you know, require um, lots of policy making to solve. Mike, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was going to I was going to toss it over to you to, to talk about that, the, the, the systemic way of fixing things and prioritizing what we fix um, or what we address and, and try to fix because we, we may have things that we can't. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what I would like to see us do with the TLTR um, is, is exactly kind of get at some of these things. There's things that we all kind of know intuitively are going on but we never have an opportunity or a place or a time to kind of talk about them in a meaningful way that actually has intention of doing something about it. We, we, we tend to be so reactive, right? We were given a problem and by the end of the semester, we have to have a solution. And I think the frustration that a lot of faculty have often is, well, why can I only choose from these three things? <laughs> why couldn't we have been thinking about this longer? And so I think if we're more proactive um, and we say we are gonna start thinking about these things. So remote learning is, is, is one of these things, right? We, we've had an experience with this now. We need to kind of figure out what that experience means to us. But at the same time, we have to think about some bigger issues. So the loss of the snow days is a plus and a minus. I, I think you're right, it keeps us on track. But we have to realize that there is an, a, a, an unfair uh, burden put on um, people who are taking care of their kids at home, which tend to be women more than men. And so how do we address this as a university? If we're worried about diversity, equity, and inclusion, then we have to be very conscious about the things that we're doing. We're thinking through what our strategic plan is. We are concerned about that. We've said so. So we need to be able to use these tools in a way that when we start to realize there's unequal impacts, we don't say, well, that tool's no good, throw it away. We say, okay, we have to have other parts of the university take a look at this. Um, so let me give a little bit of a, a pitch of what I see as Paul and I's vision of what we put together for the TLTR and what we're asking faculty to join on and, and, and be part of, um, and, and then we can open it back up again. So I think that might help a, a little bit. Um, the TLTR in the past has had five or six subcommittees and it's been you know a lot of activity going on. Um, we decided given the fatigue everybody feels, um, given the, the just the idea that we don't want to do a massive lift right now, but we don't want to wait either that we shrunk down the number of committees. We're, we're going to start with two committees and, and one committee is mobile computing and that committee is going to look at the mobile computing program, its implementation over the next four years. Think about what the future means and I'm going to get back to that in a second of what mobile computing should mean for for the future. Is it still hardware or is it something else? Um, and, and then the other committee is going to be what has been called emerging technologies in the past, innovation, innovative technologies. Um, we stole Jack Shannon's uh, course name. It, it's called uh, Ideas and Trends. And, and this committee is going to be called Ideas and Trends in Ed Tech. And the reason for, for changing the name is I felt that that technology focus is always like that's the solution. If we can just find the right technology. And the idea that it's emerging means we can only look at new things, right? We look, what made us make it through the pandemic was old technology. Skype has been around forever, right? That's what we, we just harnessed it differently. Um, so I want to have that committee um, be more looking at what are the ideas that we should be thinking about as a university. And there's gonna be things that come and go through all these committees, right? This is the teaching learning technology round table. And so at the heart of that is the technology piece, um, but I don't want it to be constrained to the point where we don't think about bigger issues. There are lots of other groups and organizations and units on campus that are tangentially related to all these things. And one of the goals that Paul and I put out there is that we should be getting ideas. And when it's an idea that's beyond the scope, if it's about governance, for example, we know where to send it. We send it to the faculty group that's in the IT committee and the faculty Senate. And we say, here's something that's come out of one of our groups. This we would suggest that you might want to look at. The same thing if something comes up about um, student affairs, right? We, we have means of then saying, well, this came out of the faculty discussions. Here's where we'd like it to go. So we want this group to be more focused on looking towards the future about um, 
not shutting things down. That happens a lot too, right? We say, well, what can't we do this? And, and somebody in the committee, often it will be me, just says, oh, we tried that. They won't let us do that. Let's move to something else. Um, just to not have that be the case, to instead have the discussion, why is that not possible right now? And what will we need to do to accomplish that? Um, so those are the two big groups. We will add action teams as necessary. If we need other subcommittees, we can add those as, as we start to have discussions. Um, but each of those groups will address unifying themes. All of the work this year, will, will they'll be asked to address four points drawn from the strategic plan. And the first one is, enhancing universities diversity equity and inclusion efforts um, including the university's affordability agenda right and so that we have a lot of discussion about this at the university and we want to make sure that we're not just giving lip service to this right that it's not some sort of racial commodification where we just we're using our good intentions to to appeal to people um, what we really need to do is have things that are going to make changes and i love looking at the mobile computing program because that was one of the most successful DEI efforts that this university has ever undertaken, right? It was taken on because of the digital divide. It was meant to be a, a starting a, a fair um, level playing field. Everybody comes in with the same technology access. Um, and I think we have to keep that in mind, right? Ian brought up the idea that AI is going to become down the road more and more important. Well, we know that there are racial biases built into AI machine learning algorithms. So we should be thinking about those things. As we think about tools, what's the impact? Um, we should be thinking about the fact that we've all learned in our teaching through, um, through teams that students have very different connectivity issues, but they also have very different um, home issues, right? I have the student who has their own desk and they're always at that desk. And I have the student who is sitting in the middle of the living room with three other siblings and they're all on their laptops with headphones trying to do work at the same time. You know, these are the kinds of things, if we're going to be doing more high flex, more hybrid, more remote, we have to really consider, well, what's the, what, what are we doing in terms of giving um, access to all the students? Uh, there's also the idea of, um, in our plan, of um, enhancing uh, or, or supporting faculty in areas of academic quality, research, and scholarship, right? So that's going to have to be a key element of all of our committees. Uh, also advancing student research and learning. We haven't talked about students much yet today, um, but that's our job is the students. And I thought it was interesting in the slide that Ian showed about how do we prepare to teach our students in the future? Who needs the most training? Students didn't appear on the list. And there's this assumption that students come in because they're digital natives. They come in with this great knowledge of how to use the technology. And we all know that they know how to use technology in the way that they want to use technology. But it's our job to prepare them for how to use that technology um, in, in the future. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that's going to be a big part of this as well. And with the with the strategic plan, there is an emphasis on graduate education. We have to start to think about this. Um, and we have always done mobile computing, for an example, as just an undergraduate um, exercise. So maybe it's time to think about in a new mobile computing uh, uh, concept, where do the graduate students fit in and how do we integrate them as well? Um, and then the last one is to promote internal and external partnerships and collaborations, increase transparency and communication. And that's where all of these tangential groups and units, um, we need to start to stop replicating each other's work, stop duplicating each other's work. We need to work together and, um, and to try to really start to build something that is more than just one off, more of an integrated vision of how do we move everybody forward uh, and so that's kind of the, 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 the basis of how we're going to do this. Our goals are relatively modest uh, for this year. We want to do SWOT analysis, so strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We want to do that for all of the faculty in those two categories, mobile computing and for what's coming down the road in terms of technology use in the university. Um, and we want to have a report at the end of the year that kind of looks at the university as a whole and where are our strengths and where are our weaknesses and what do we need to be worried about and preparing for um, and what are we missing out on? What's right there and we're just not taking advantage of it. Um, and at the end of the year, we will have that report. We'll share that with the, the provost. We'll also share that with all of our colleagues. Um, and we're also going to propose that we um, create a new budget for the provost to consider. Um, and if there are things that we could be investing in now to prepare us for things that we know are coming down the road, um, we want to be able to put that together and have a proposal that um, they can consider 
and they can make decisions about. Um, so that's kind of for this year. That's what the kickoff is. And it's um, it's it's work, but I think it's engaging work and it's work that we can all hopefully feel positive about because it's taking on kind of a, a, a real ownership over where the, the university is moving um, and having a vision for ourselves. You know, one of the the concerns of mine and I know for a lot of people uh, for higher ed in general, this is not just the Seton Hall dig it is the role of external consultants in making decisions in higher ed, right? Well, if we want to be able to fight against that, one of the things to do is to take the time and the energy to work together to come up with our own visions and our own plans that are well researched. And we have the skills and the ability to do that. We just need this group to come together and do that work. So my pitch is please um, talk to your colleagues, find people who you think might be interested in taking on this kind of work and send them our way. We'll do a formal call for, for recruiting, but um, in the meantime, you can share the link to, to Ian's talk and uh, and hopefully we can really kind of have a revitalized group this year. Does anybody have any last questions for Marianne? Sorry or, for the filibuster. Or 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 Mike. Whew, I, start, <laughs> I thought John McCain came back with the the outfit you have on and oh and, wow. Thank <laughs> you. Such a maverick. Um uh, and anybody have any last questions before we sort of wrap up? Um, you know, Mike alluded to, uh, you know, doing a call for participation, finding out what people are um, uh, in, interested in, in doing. So we'll, we'll do that. We, there is a steering committee. Milan, if you can post the TLTR website URL in, in the chat, um, just so that people can go and sort of see what the charge is from the provost. Um, and who makes up what, what we sort of call the executive committee. Uh, so we'll, we're going we're gonna to call that group together, um, go over lots of the things that came up here, sort of decide, um, you know, what are our immediate next steps, and then, um, and, and then start to uh, elicit people to, to work on the two overarching groups and then um, uh, go from there and see what happens organically over the rest of the academic year. Uh, Anka, you have a question? Not a question, but rather saying thank you to both uh, Paul and Michael for bringing this together. And, uh, you know, uh, the IT committee is here to support you. So just let us know how you can help. Thank you. I forgot you were you were the, one of the co-chairs this year. Uh, there, there's a lot of, there's a big team that goes behind everything that that we do. So, you know, uh, Lisa Martinelli's not on the call. She had the day off today, but but she did a lot of work. Obviously, Milan, Stanek, and and Renee Chikino, and really the rest of the TLTC. Right? It, it went once this group, this large group of people, uh, filter out all the ideas and things that we want to change. It's it's their responsibility to make it a reality and support you guys. So, uh, you know, uh, I look forward to a really good and engaging year, a revitalizing of of the TLTR. I I think. Bringing back faculty chair was 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 a, a really great idea um, th this year to to give us the momentum that that we need to to leapfrog in front of all the colleagues and peers that have caught up with us over the last 20 years. And I have no doubt that's what we'll do. Thank you everybody for for your time today. Thank you everyone.